Hello, in this video we're going to cover the main aspects of parametric surfaces. We're going to talk about surface parameter properties, domain, orientation, and I will also introduce some of the most relevant tools and commands. To better understand this tutorial, I recommend watching the video on curve parameterization, as many concepts will be reoccurring here as well. So let's start by checking surface details in Rhino. We can see that it's a single valid open NURB surface, which has four boundary edges. A parametric surface is a function of two independent parameters over a two-dimensional domain. Here we have parameters u and v. The domain of the u parameter is 0 to 20, and the domain of the v parameter is also 0 to 20. In the main menu bar under Analyze Surface, we can find some options to change the preview to Analyze and better understand surface geometry. I'm going to use the environmental map here. So this particular surface is smooth. It has no kinks or breaking points. Currently, we do not see any information regarding surface topology. To see surface isocurves, we need to turn on the isocurve preview in the display tab. Now we have a better understanding of the underlying structure. You can also add arbitrary isocurves. Simply select the surface and type in the command line insert kink. We can change the parameter choosing the u or v direction or both. I'm going to place some curves on the surface now. And uh, I can also turn on the control point preview so you could see how this would affect modeling possibilities. Let's move on to the grasshopper and reference this surface. So just like we have a tool to evaluate a curve, we also have a similar tool to evaluate a surface. The evaluate surface takes a surface to evaluate and uh, bidimensional UV parameters. We could use the multidimensional slider or MD slider here. And we can see a small frame on a surface, which is the output of the evaluate surface component. It is a tangent plane to a surface at a given point. I'm going to go under display and change the size of the plane preview. The evaluate surface component also outputs the point on a surface at the UV, surface normal vector which coincides with the frame Z direction and the U and V vectors. I'm going to add a vector preview for clarity. As I move the MD slider, you can see how it covers just a very small portion of the surface because the surface domain is much larger than the domain of the MD slider. I'm using the deconstruct two-dimensional domain to see the surface domains which both are from 0 to 20, while the MD slider domain is from 0 to 1. Similarly to the curves domain, surface domain is not necessarily directly related to the surface dimensions. And to illustrate that, I will modify the surface so we can see the changes in the dimensions while the domain stays the same. OK. So if we'd like the MD slider to cover the whole surface, we should normalize the input surface. Let's right click on the container and choose to reparameterize. And we can see how now the point moves across the whole surface. Since the UV input takes points, we can simply supply point coordinates with a panel. We can also supply a list of coordinates. And quick note, when supplying a list of coordinates, we would need to separate vector display for u and v directions or graph the input so that each coordinate is treated as a separate list. Let's move on to further analysis. Go under Curve, Spline and choose Isocurve. Input the surface and the UV coordinates. We extract the isocurves separately in u and v directions. Note, the output is grafted here, so you might want to flatten the output if you need the curves on the same list. So we can use manual inputs with a panel 
but we could also construct a list of points. I'm using the range component here, constructing points diagonally. And if we need to, we can remap the values. I'm going to illustrate this with a graph mapper. Just make sure that the domains match properly. To better illustrate how these points determine isocurve positions on the surface, I will also add the curve on surface component. Let's now talk more in depth about the isocurves. So like any curve, an isocurve has a start and an end, meaning it has a direction. In Rhino, let's select the surface and type in DIR for direction. The first two options, U-reverse and V-reverse, are related to the isocurve direction. Let's choose Reverse U, click Enter, and we see that the isocurve distribution has changed, so now the V division starts from the opposite boundary. Let's try reversing the V direction. Now the distribution of U isocurves starts from the opposite boundary. Let's select the surface again and this time choose the Swap UV option. The U isocurves now represent former V isocurves, but the subdivision doesn't change. Ok, it's time to move on and look at some other tools. Under Surface Utilities, let's grab the Divide Surface component. Input the surface and the U and V count. We get the points on surface, normals at those points, and also UV parameters, so coordinates within the domain. I'm going to go back to Rhino now and for clarity reasons choose to color back faces in red, so we can see how surface normals point away from the back face. If we use the command flip, we flip the surface normal direction, in other words, its orientation. And if we need to construct tangent planes at the division points, we could do that using the surface frames component. Let's go back under Surface Utilities and choose the offset surface. Input the surface and the distance value. So by default, the offset coincides with the surface's normal direction. We can flip the surface in Grasshopper with a native flip component. For now, let's input the surface and reconnect, so we can witness that the surface was flipped. If we need to offset multiple surfaces with possibly different normal directions, we could use the Guide Surface option. And if you are having any issues here, you can also try using a separate, more primitive surface as a guide. The Offset Surface component also has a Trimmed option. So currently, this surface is untrimmed and it has four boundaries. An example of a trimmed surface could be one cut out of the untrimmed one. A trimmed surface retains the structure of the initial untrimmed surface. We're going to talk more about trimmed surfaces a bit later, but for now I'd like to go back to the Divide Surface component and focus on the output data structure. For visual purposes, I'm going to create polylines from points on the surface. In this instance, polylines are created along the U direction. We see them as rows in the preview. If we swap the original surfaces UV in Rhino, we'll see the polylines as columns, but still along the U direction. Notice also that surface point subdivision is swapped as well. I'm gonna undo the swap commands, go under Sets, Tree, and take Flip Matrix. This tool swaps rows with columns of the matrix-like data tree. So in this instance, we create polylines along the V direction seen as columns in the preview. Notice the point distribution stays the same because we are only manipulating the data tree, not the surface. Let's now move on to extracting subsurfaces. Under Math, Domain, pick the Divide domain. Input the surface and then the U and V count. The output is a list of surface subdomains, so we need to use an additional component here. 
Under Surface, Utilities, find the Isotrim tool. Input the surface and then the domains to extract. We get a list of untrimmed subsurfaces. If we deconstruct these subsurfaces, we can extract surface division points as a separate list per piece. I'm using polylines again to illustrate data tree structure here. So in this instance, I get closed polylines, which could then be used to create straight line boundary surfaces. I'm going to join and bake the geometry and then use the environmental map preview in Rhino to show that these subsurfaces are not necessarily planar. Let's go back a bit and see how we could construct and extract a specific subdomain. Under Math Domain, pick Construct Two-Dimensional Domain from four numbers. So the four numbers are specified bounds, the start and the end values for U and V domains. Since I'm using a normalized surface, the bounds for the subdomain are 0 to 1. OK, it's time for the question. How would you extract parts of multiple surface subdomains? Please pause the video and think through the steps before continuing. I'm going to simply add another isotrim component and use it to extract parts from the subset surfaces. I get an error because the input surface domains do not match the constructed subdomain, so I need to normalize the subset surfaces. I'm going to turn off unnecessary previews and change the domain bounds to illustrate different slicing possibilities. We could also add additional pieces and extrude or modify them in other ways. A quick note here, currently in the top preview we see that the surface division grid is perpendicular and regular. Surface subdivision strongly depends on surface topology, so if I'd move some of the control points I would distort the subdivision grid. And surely I would also change the initial surface geometry. Up until now we focused on an open untrimmed surface. It's time to talk a bit more about a trimmed surface subdivision. As I have mentioned before, a trimmed surface retains its untrimmed structure. So when I use the divide domain and isotrim, I still get the untrimmed result. When subdividing or paneling trimmed surfaces, we need to know how we'd like to solve the trimmed boundary. And we might need to use additional tools and algorithms. To illustrate the issue, here are a few examples of creating a mesh from a trimmed surface. From these few examples, you can see that there are many ways to subdivide trimmed surfaces. But of course, we could also simply trim the panels at the boundaries. So let's try to do that. In the Grasshopper component palettes under Intersect, Shape, you will find tools for brep splitting. In this instance, the Trim Solid tool will suffice. Connect the subsurfaces and make sure that the trimming shapes are solids. So the splitting worked, but we have some leftovers. There are a few ways to solve that. In this case, I'm simply going to join the subsurfaces before trimming them. And afterwards, if I need to access the segment separately, I can deconstruct BREP and extract its faces. So these are the basic concepts behind subdividing trimmed surfaces. Next on our list are closed surfaces. If I create an extrusion using a periodically closed curve, I get a periodic surface that has continuous curvature, so we can freely move the seam around. If we have a closed but non-periodic surface, the seam position is fixed. This means there are kinks or breaks in the curvature or some control points coincide with the surface seam. In a case of more than one seam, we would actually get a closed untrimmed poly surface and depending on the tools you are using, you might need to subdivide the constituent surfaces separately. Let's look a bit deeper into the surface topology. Here I have two very similar surfaces created the same way 
but using curves that have different numbers of control points. So the bottom surface has visibly an even domain division, and the top surface has a more even division. These divisions are the direct result of the curve structure, and it's worth having in mind that you could solve some topology issues simply by rebuilding the input curves or changing the surface creation method. Alternatively, we could manipulate surface topology by remapping the domains. I'm not going to dive into a thorough explanation of each component here, just going to show you how this could be done. So we can deconstruct the two-dimensional domain into four numbers, and then remap the values using the graph mapper, for instance. The issue here is that the graph mapper has only one input, while the deconstruct domain has four, and we need at least two values to be remapped. I'm going to go under Sets, Tree, and grab the Entwine tool. I'm only going to combine and remap the V domain, and you can see the remapped values. Now we need to construct domain from the remapped values, keeping the U domain the same, and input the new V domain. And for that, we need to explode the data tree to access the branches separately. So this could be a way of fixing uneven topology issues without recreating the surface. Finally, I'd like to mention that in these tutorials we focus on the innate grasshopper tools, but there are a lot of great plugins that could be very useful. I recommend checking out the Lunchbox, Pufferfish, and also Angons, especially if you're working not only with surfaces, but with meshes too. So this is it for this tutorial. Let us know if you have enjoyed it. In the next video, we're going to continue covering surface properties. Join me there!